Good evening from Jerusalem. Erev Tov, Erev Tov from Jerusalem. Welcome to the last episode of the Winter Live series, 50 Shades of Health. This is the season finale of an incredible number of programs that we have been sharing with you. It is my pleasure at this point to introduce my colleague and co-moderator of this event, Gidon Melmet, director of the donors department at the Adassa offices in Israel. And it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and co-moderator, Jorge Diner, executive director of Hadassah International. This program, this evening, is really warming our hearts. The hearts of all the friends, supporters, and fans of the work that the Adassa Medical Organization, our dear hospitals in Jerusalem, our doctors, our researchers, are not just doing today, but are really dreaming about the future and making it real by planting the seeds of what will fly from here to the future. The Guardians of the Heart is an incredible opportunity, not just to keep our hearts warm in supporting Adassa, but also a way to look at the future of our lives in a more safe, in a safer and better health for our hearts. We're honored to have with us today the people leading the Irma and Paul Milstein Heart Center of the Heart Institute at Adassa, just recently ranked among Newsweek's list of the world's best specialized hospitals. I'd like to first introduce Professor Ophir Amil, head of Hadassah's Heart Institute. Professor Amil, thank you for joining us. In, refer in referring to advanced medicine, uh, we cannot know what the future holds, but many of us feel that when it comes to heart medicine, the future is now, that saying could not be more accurate, where patients enter treatment in utterly life-threatening situations and walk out after treatment on their feet the very same day. Professor Amir, broadly speaking from your vantage point, looking 10, 15 years into the future, what, what can we expect in the future of heart medicine? Give us a glimpse, for example, Will we not only treat, but replace a damaged heart? Okay, so first of all, uh, Gidon and Jorge, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, when we are talking about uh, future and, and uh, medicine, you know, the cardiology is, is, is a leading uh, part of it. And uh, I'm delighted to have uh, both uh, Dr. David Luria and Dr. David Planner with me we're going to show you that the future is already here in Adassa, but obviously we are planning for a much uh, better future and much more sophisticated future. Uh, if I may uh, uh, just uh, comment about uh, the contribution of Adassa as a whole and Adassa International, because basically what you are able to do is to uh, afford us to, to do these, uh, these uh, things and this technology for the benefit of the patient. And we appreciate it and we see it as a, as a great honor for all, all of us, all three of us, uh, to participate in this event. Now, if I have to translate the future, I will uh, translate it to kind of three Ps. One P will be percutaneus, which basically means that procedures that are done through major surgery and, uh, and horrible cuts, etc., etc., are going to be done by a much simpler approach through the skin, through the uh, catheterization room, et cetera, et cetera, and you're going to see more than that. I think that we are going to see the second P as a personalized medicine, because obviously uh, uh, one size fits all is not going to be the, the future, and it already is not the future. And the third issue is going to be, the third P is going to be preventive, because we uh, will be able to uh, identify potential problems rather than to run and fix it with the latest state, which obviously is, is much more uh, much more important. So I would like to start with a, a one a major issue, which actually is the most common cardiovascular disease, and this is going to be the heart failure, of course, uh, from which about eight million Americans are already identified as having this this disease. And with your permission, I just want to show you very quickly with a few slides 
where we are. And, and when I was in, 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 in Texas Medical Center less than 15 years ago, these were the heart pumps that we implanted in Texas Medical Center, Houston, Texas, one of the most, the most, most advanced places that, that takes care of, of, of advanced heart failure. Basically, what we do is we uh, support the heart with a device, and you see the pumps that are connected to the, to the heart and to the major vessel. And this is what we did literally in the beginning of 2000, so it's not too far away. Just to show you what we do already, this is the console, by the way, you can understand what the ability of the patient to walk with these uh, huge consoles. It's like the old IBM uh, computers uh, 15 years ago or 50 years ago, and you can see and you can understand the, 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 the disability of the patient that needs uh, their damaged heart to be supported with. This is what we implant nowadays in Adassa. These are the pumps nowadays. It's less than a cell phone, even uh, the latest version of the iPhone. It's less than a cell phone. And you can see the pump which is inserted into the heart for a major surgery still, but you can understand the, the, the differences that existed already uh, uh, less than 15 years ago. And this is what we do in Adassa, uh, and we did uh, uh, more, th more than several of these patients and actually saved their lives with these heart pumps for their damaged heart because a transplantation was not, uh, was not ready to go. This is a sentence coming from uh, one of the most prestigious medical journal in cardiology. It was done in 2014. And this is an editorial comment. And it says the patient with these heart pumps through myocardial recovery in which function returns to normal is unfortunately akin to open legend, often discussed, but seldom seen. This is something to see and to understand. And this is the urban legend that we did a, a week ago. This is a patient who is, was in, he's still in his 50s and he suffered from devastating heart damage. And we did not have any heart transplant to put in because there was no available donor. So about a year ago, we put the, the device that we saw in the beginning, the heart pump. Unbelievable, and like the urban legend that was, was described uh, in, in the previous uh, slide, in the previous context, what we did was, we did after a year that this heart pump actually uh, uh, was able to, to get some rest to his damaged heart, and the heart, his own heart, made a full recovery. And the patient had the second operation in which we took out this uh, uh, heart pump, and the patient is going home without anything and without any need for heart transplantation. So this is really a miracle and I, I, I agree, fully agree with the, with the previous uh, concept. How far can we go? You can see with this device, and this is a total artificial heart in which we replace the whole heart with the titanium. Actually, you can see that both ventricles are, uh, uh, are represented by these, by these two parts of the device. This is a total artificial heart. So that what we that what we do uh, that what we do nowadays. Now, uh, 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 where are we going to? We are going to uh, in I guess in about a decade or so to a place that probably heart transplantation are not are not going to be needed at all, and the whole short shortage of, of donors is not going to be a crucial or a barrier because we are going to use much smaller devices. We are going to let the heart to recover, and then we are going to take it out. We are going to use stem cells that are going to be injected through the first procedure and let all of this technology and wonderful biology uh, uh, new understanding uh, uh, to be uh, in support of, of the patient and his damaged heart. And I believe that we are on the verge of solving almost every uh, uh, weak heart muscle uh, uh, that is going uh, to, to exist in any patient in the, in the next decade. That that is a, that is sounds amazing. What you know before we delve deeper uh, into uh, what sounds like we are at the verge of of um, a revolution. What can you tell us about? You know, you're talking about art already using pumps, artificial hearts. What can you tell us about the success rates uh, relative to say ten years ago and uh, where you anticipate we're going? 
about uh, nine out of 10 patients who are going to be implanted with heart pumps is going to go home and, and uh, do li literally, literally almost a normal quality of life. The only uh, main limitation that we, we give them is uh, to avoid showers, which is for some people, myself included, is, is a little bit of a problem. And you can't go to the to the deep sea and and, and use the, the swimming pool. Other than that, you can you can fly, you can you can ride the horse, you can you can you can use your bike, you can do whatever whatever you want to do, because uh, your heart is now supported with with a great device which is very small. All of it is implanted. There is a very small tube go out of the, of the skin, but that's it. Nobody sees it. And, and this is this is something that that really saves lives because uh, uh, the, the need for heart transplantation because of the because of the prevalence that is so high with heart failure and and the supply of the heart donors is not enough. So this is this is an excellent replacement and uh, indifferent for for example when you put your hand in a cast and, and the hand is, is your arm is getting uh, atrophic and, 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 and the muscles. Are going to deteriorate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Actually, when you put the heart into some rest, like this, this uh, 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 pump is doing, uh, it let him recovers. And this is something that we are going to explore better and better and more and more in the future. And this is something which is really uh, uh, fascinating because you don't expose the, the, the patient to heart transplantation and the whole uh, problems that are coming with heart transplantation, including. Many, many, many medications that you have to take in order to prevent the rejection of, of, of the implanted heart. Well, let me let me let me ask you one thing, uh, Professor uh, Amir. I, um, one of the sessions we ran uh, in this uh, series was called "Honey, I Shrunk the Organs." That was about organoids, but then we dealt a lot, you know, in this in this series about uh, the different use of nanotechnology and the the hybrid models of uh, artificial uh, technology and actually existing and natural organs and tissues. So I, I really like the way you, you, you show the, the, uh, the, you did the analogy between like the old IBM computers and the old ways, you know, that uh, artificial hearts were built and, you know, how it's evolving to now. Do you see a use of nanotechnology in the future in this guy, kind of technology so that they will be less invasive, less, uh, threatening for the body and you know anything you can relate to that in this issue yes uh, the the nanotechnology is, is is already doing its its first steps actually what we are planning right now what is what is in the pipeline is actually a hot pumps which are uh, on the size of a very small uh, battery that's going to be the whole the whole hot pump uh, the other issue which we are going to uh, to invest a lot of time and effort is going to is is the issue of uh, charging the the heart pump. So you won't need any battery that is going to be outside of the body, and this is going to be huge relief. So you are going to sit in the office with a very small, tiny uh, 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 battery in, in your heart, which is actually going to do all the pumping of of, of the heart. And it's going to be to be charged like you you are doing uh, you, you are charging your your cell phone, and and uh, uh, once the procedure is going to be uh, with a very very small and tiny uh, uh, parts because of the nanotechnology, then obviously the whole surgery and the recovery and and the potential uh, candidates for it are going to be are going to be in, in, in a much larger scale. Because uh, even very very sick and very very old patients are going to be uh, to be uh, uh, candidates for, for these procedures, and we will be able to offer them all of them. You know, you're you're, you're referring to the the uh, electric com um, kind of characteristic of the heart and the pumps, and uh, I think at this point I would like to introduce uh, Professor David Luria, director of Hadassah's medical electrophysiology unit at, uh, at the Heart Institute. Professor Luria, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, exactly you. one month ago, um, for, the, for the first time in Israel, you led an inno innovative form of treatment called ablation, which treats irregular heartbeat through the thorax to areas in the heart that had previously been difficult or impossible to access. What made this treatment possible? 
Yes. Um, in general speaking, the electrical system of the heart is uh, uh, probably as important as the mechanical, even though the mechanical is a measure what heart supposed to do with no regulation and uh, appropriate electrical signals that heart have to get to work properly, then the whole mechanical, even healthy mechanical heart will not do the job. So the electricity of the heart is a huge issue. It's extremely important. And actually we have quite a few different diseases that make uh, it uh, working improperly. And we do have uh, many uh, different approaches to fix the systems. And, and we do even today very good job with this. Uh, one of the problem, as you mentioned, is that not any part of the heart you can reach when you go usual way through the intravascular catheterization of the heart, because the thickness of the heart may prevent you to reach the out layer of the, uh, of the heart muscle. And that is why this novel approach to go through the directly through the chest may be very helpful. And as you mentioned, it had been done uh, for a few years already to get to the ventricle uh, of the heart, the most uh, bigger part of the muscle, but the smaller and still very important part is atrial uh, uh, muscle is, is not have been reached too much with the, this novel approach. So we've done some uh, novel uh, uh, procedures to, to make this possible and it's actually look, working well. So if we, if we take, for example, sudden cardiac death, what do you anticipate treatment to prevent sudden cardiac death uh, will look like in the future? Yeah, it's very tragic page actually in the cardiology because many times uh, that relatively healthy people and even absolutely healthy, but mostly who already some problem, but looks was taken care of properly, over a sudden will uh, stop Walking. And that's what happened when we're talking about sudden uh, unexpected cardiac death or cardiac arrest. It is electrical phenomenon. And that is why we, we need to, uh, to know that it's going to happen and to prevent it because whenever it's already occurred, it's a very few minutes to fix it before uh, irreversible damage to the body will, to the brain first of all will happen. So that is why this one of the most central areas in the uh, cardiology and electrophysiology. And uh, it is an, a lot of new advantage already happens and another will come uh, soon. But in general, we can say that if, if we have good diagnosis of the heart problem, these uh, sophisticated devices we implanted under the skin, and you can show this uh, kind of uh, device we've seen here. And then, uh, and then we can put the small pacemakers in the heart and bigger uh, devices such as defibrillators. And the first slide probably will show you this novel diagnostic uh, devices that will make possible early diagnosis of cardiac arrhythmia and then treat it properly to prevent sudden cardiac death. Uh, on the right side, uh, uh, okay, on the right side of the sense that you can see the novel small pacemaker that prevent heart from stop beating. And this is now day is very small. It can be implanted within the heart, as you can see here. And, and uh, this is a new advantage that for the recent years. And on the next slide, you can appreciate that the, another uh, device that make uh, defibrillate heart in terms of uh, stop this cardiac arrest and return heart to the normal work immediately. When the cardiac arrest occurs, defibrillator until recently, we'll need to put the wires into the heart. And then this new device uh, allowed us to put the wires under the skin and it's enough to, uh, to prevent cardiac arrest. So answering to your, to your question, this is the way today and in the near future to take care of this very, very serious complication of the electrical disorder of the car. Jorge, you're muted. 
Prof Professor uh, Luria, you know, I think it's a, uh, I, I was thinking about some kind of analogy again, you know, with the, with, with the, with the, with the other world, you not know, with the human body. And I was thinking, you know, in, in, in essential installations like factories and, and others, you know, you have energy and then you have a series of backup uh, options that, you know, will keep the energy and the electricity running, even if electricity goes off. So do you envision in the future people with a, a, a potential heart condition having that kind of backup option? If something goes wrong and electricity stops, that uh, there, is, there is something that will keep the body to avoid sudden death, uh, as, as you described. Yeah, it's actually very uh, right thinking. And we, we already doing such things, not for everyone. But if you recognize that one particular person is in a risk for sudden uh, cardiac arrest or stop heart for beating, then we will put him uh, some device and devices became smaller and easy implanted that will follow every bit of the heart and see will never stop beating it would at the initial step just put this backup bits and and keep them beat it is a normal rate and in more catastrophic situation when it's totally disarranged and start uh, fibrillating then they'll diagnose this and and put a shock electrical shock and return it to the normal normal work so yes it's there and it's became more and more sophisticated and easy implantable to the patients i i listened to you saying um easier and easier and it still sounds very sophisticated uh from to me um with us and i'd like to welcome uh, dr professor david planel uh, Professor Planner, you're a senior interventional cardiologist at Hadassah's Heart Institute. Um, and I'd like to ask you, most people with aneurysms, which is a weakening of an artery wall that creates a bulge of the artery and could, God forbid, uh, cause rupture, um, they have to choose between very risky surgery or waiting for their aneurysm to, to rupture. Now there's a new method to repair the deadly medical condition. Tell us about it. Sorry, you, you're, all, you're muted. Okay, thank you. I've been fortunate enough to participate and take part in the development from the initial R&D process to the uh, uh, through the preclinical animal studies and, and now uh, through human studies of a, a really revolutionary uh, device that uh, supposed to replace, uh, in cases needed, the aortic arch. The aorta is the main vessel, the main artery that goes out of the heart, and it has been replaced in, in aneurysms uh, for many years in the abdomen, in the belly, in the lower part of the body. But in the arch, arch remain a most challenging part, which most patients weren't treated because the surgery, the alternative, uh, is a huge surgery. It's actually the uh, the most devastating or, or big surgery in, in medicine because you need actually not only to stop the heart from pumping and to go in a heart lung machine, but also to disconnect the brain. So you actually freeze the patient and, and disconnect the brain, try to do the surgery as, as quick as possible in order to prevent damage to the brain. And then warm up and hope that everything is okay. Obviously only very young and very healthy patients were able to undergo this surgery. So we actually developed a method that is much less invasive and actually with three needle ports, you can actually replace the heart, uh, the, the arch of the aorta and, and treat the aneurysm. And this is really a revolutionary uh, 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 device. I can show you and since this is a very, you, you, uh, what you are dealing with is a really complex 3D uh, and pathologic uh, organ. And you come with the uh, endovascular device, a device that is supposed to put in the cat lab. And it's very hard to predict 
how the device will see it and what are the pitfalls that uh, you're going to meet during the procedure. So actually, we, if we're talking about the future, this is, I think, the future because what we are seeing here is based on the CT scan of the, of the patient, we're able to create an STL file. STL is a file that you use in a 3D printing. And uh, so this is the aorta. Here is the heart, which is not shown here. And this is the arch, the aortic arch. And these are the main vessels that go, that go to the brain. And this is the aneurysm. This ugly uh, bulge over here, this is the aneurysm. This is what kills the patient. This is from the city. And we translate it to the STL file. And from here, we 3D print the actual anatomy. And you can see some of our patients that were treated, this is only a small portion of the patients, and all these aortas were printed from the original CT of the patient. And then we took it to this flow simulator, to the cath lab, mm -hmm. and actually rehearsed the procedure. We were able to tell whether we're going to succeed or fail, what are the critical points that need to be addressed, and how we're going to attack them during the surgery. And we actually were able, this is almost unbelievable, that you are during the surgery, uh, we felt like a deja vu. The feeling that the situation currently being experienced has already been experienced in the past. Here you can see a patient that we treated at Adassa Medical Center with an aneurysm. And this is the model. And we were able to implant the device here. And this is day later, the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, procedure that you can see that it sits exactly the same way, very predictable. And we were able to rehearse the true surgery a day before we were able to do it as many times as we want. And this is really a game changer in this arena. I, I think, I think uh, um, Professor Planner, I think, you know, I've seen uh, this at, uh, at, at the heart center, uh, uh, visiting the heart center and seeing the work you do. And I think this is one of the most fascinating things in terms of uh, planning, prevention, and uh, before an actual procedure that, uh, that is so complicated. And I, and I find also, and I think you have examples of that, that this is also an, a great way also to have an impact in, in patients that might come from all over, all over the world, or from all over the place to our facilities or any other facilities in the future where you can actually, you don't need the patient uh, in the clinic before it actually has to come to the clinic because you can replicate the, the heart and the functions and just try and try an error before. And I think that's not just uh, an interesting development for, uh, for the heart, but potentially even for other organs in the future. Um, uh, uh, and I wanted to comment on that. What do you think? As you know, we are in the spirit of closing this uh, series on the future of medicine. Is there a, a, a way that you can uh, uh, preview or foresee that this kind of technology used now for the heart could be used in other organs in the future? Uh, I think so. Uh, I'm really sure that, you know, the, you know, the sky is the limit. Once you have the technology and you have the uh, ability to transfer it and to rehearse and to be able to treat patients for all, all over the world, we are able to do many things that we even cannot imagine now. Just for, as an example, assuming that the patient cannot travel or is very far away, this, you know, with this technology, we're flying from New Zealand to all Europe, India, and Canada so far. And now we're starting to do it in the US. But uh, as you know, the last year, the COVID-19, we weren't able to travel around. So what we are doing, we are uh, proctoring the, the procedure uh, as a remote proctoring. And what we are doing now that I'm guiding the local team with this technology, both on the rehearsal on the flow model and and during the procedure itself. I sit here at Adassa uh, and, and I'm really participating in the procedure. Just imagine if I could really do a virtual surgery here and that my hands will be actually the operator hands on the other side of the world. This may be, you know, this is may open to every, every field in medicine actually, the, fa the fact that you can do a procedure remotely is just amazing. And, uh, and the technology of, of producing organs, 3D printing, tissues, 
there are some, uh, 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 I think in orthopedics, they are producing already uh, joints. Uh, in, and I think that in the future, maybe the near future, we can not uh, plan an off-the-shelf device and fit to the right patient the right size, but rather print its own valve, for example, and implant its own valve or, or the original uh, size and, and shape of the valve in the patient based on his anatomy after 3D printing. But you know, with imagination, we can go very far. I think that that's, uh, that's an incredible uh, vision for the future, really, as we, as we come to the close of this, of this series. You mentioned the challenges that uh, COVID present travel-wise, and we've had a question from, uh, uh, from Jane Strum uh, to comment whichever one of you feels um, you'd like to, to comment on the damage to the heart caused by COVID-19. I think that Professor Omega... <laughs> This was just a reminder that uh, low-tech technology is still important. <laughs> so don't get uh, too confused. Uh, well, the COVID-19 and the heart is is uh, is a big issue. Uh, what we found out, and it took us a good couple of months to understand the the, the way it works, but the a, a tendency for enormous clotting. Uh, through the COVID-19, we see a lot of uh, pulmonary emboli and, and thrombi all over the vascular system, heart included. Uh, we see a huge uh, increase in uh, pulmonary emboli and, and actually Dr. Plane, although he, he transferred the, 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 <laughs> the, the, uh, the microphone to myself, but he's, he's doing, uh, he's a leading uh, uh, team in Israel, in Adassa, for taking uh, patients with pulmonary emboli to the cath lab and actually put local uh, through the catheter that is, is inside the pulmonary arteries and, and is injecting uh, uh, is thrombolysis. Uh, it's a very small amount that prevents major bleeding for the patient, but dissolves uh, the clot. And this is a life-saving procedure actually led by Dr. Planner uh, in Adassa in Israel and actually worldwide, I, I should say. Uh, so we see with the COVID a lot of inflammation, including the heart. We see a lot of uh, inflammation that uh, is kind of a response against the virus, but the downside of it is, is a direct heart damage because inflammation by itself is, 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 is causing damage to the heart. It's not only the virus, actually it's, it's the response for the virus. And, uh, and the clots, which are all over, uh, even in young person, uh, even in athlete, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a very um, devastating disease. But I think all of us already know that. And uh, some of it is post-COVID as well. Yes, we see uh, there are a lot of issues with uh, post-COVID uh, and uh, a lot of side effects, uh, heart-wise uh, related. Uh, palpitations, being tired, uh, uh, some uh, chest discomfort. Uh, arrhythmias, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in many recovers uh, uh, after COVID-19. Uh, the the good news, I think, that we know much better now and we understand much better than obviously we did a year ago. Uh, we had uh, several patients that we put on ECMO and use a lot of anti-inflammatory medications, uh, uh, immunoglobulins, uh, steroids, immunosuppression. So we treat the patients now in a much better uh, way. In Adassa, we had, uh, unfortunately for, for, for the patients, but uh, we had in Jerusalem a, a huge outbreak of the COVID, even much more than in many other uh, places uh, in Israel and even worldwide. So we got a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and a lot of understanding. We use a plasma. We did some uh, in Adassa, uh, the, the, uh, the patients who are treating, the physicians, the team that are, are, are treating uh, COVID patients. Uh, got a lot of expertise, and, and, and uh, I think that we are going to be in the front of, of this disease uh, as well in Adassa. But ho hopefully it won't be a part of the future. I hope it's going to be part of the maximum of the present.
I think we had enough of that. You know, taking 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 uh, us back into the into the future, and you know, I, I just want to ask some some from my side. You know, last question that for any of you to answer, of, or, or each one of you to answer, with some short answer at least to uh, uh, try to wrap up. Uh, and and the question is about surprises. I think one of the things that anybody who gets over fifty knows that you know surprises might come. It might they might come, you know, at an earlier age. But that's something that I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a main concern. Talking you know, as a lay person, um, uh, uh, on behalf of the millions of people who are you know thinking about that, and I think that one of the things that uh, I hear from the presentations you were making is that uh, we might be facing a future where there will be less and less surprises, or at least we can prevent some of them, and we can prevent the surprises in the middle of an intervention, and we can prevent the surprises of a heart failure one way or another. It really connected me to what we were speaking in our previous uh, uh, event when we were speaking about the use of artificial intelligence in personalized medicine in cancer and how that will also have an impact in predicting, in preventing, in, in early uh, looking at the signs that might cause disease and eventually this. So my question is, are we going to see a future where there will, will be very minimal surprises when it comes to hard functioning. Yes, and I will tell you why I'm so sure about it. Because the key word is genetics. And once we will be able to uh, map the, uh, the, the variation in the genomic, uh, in the genomic uh, uh, formula of each person, no doubt that we are going to find out, uh, and we are doing it already, especially uh, uh, Professor Luya is doing it in, in cardiac arrhythmia and, and prevention of sudden cardiac death. We know that there are valve disease which are associated with specific genes. We know definitely that, that occluded arteries and, 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 and issues of cholesterol and tendency for inflammation, all of it occludes the, 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 the coronary arteries and, and, and block the, the, the blood supply to the heart. All of this will be, will be able to be traced with the issue of, of genetics. In that event, we'll be able to, to get the patients, even before they are patients, but the candidates for patients, treat them very aggressively, already from early age, even, even go back all the way to, to childhood, etc. For You know, for example, just to understand, we know nowadays that uh, if, if a, a child was born after a, a IVF treatment, he has a risk for uh, for heart muscle issue. So you know, so the whole whole uh, issue of, of uh, uh, starting to to have the problem already in in the 30s and the 40s is is an old one. We know that there is a tendency, there is a genetic predisposition, and once we will be able to trace it and, and and treat very aggressively and prevent it, obviously the surprises are going are not going to be. There. I, I uh, just before we. Wrap up, uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank, to thank really each, each one of you for what, uh, what you do and uh, the entire team that is part of the Heart Institute. This is also really an opportunity to thank the Davidson Family Foundation and the Milstein Family Foundation for helping to establish what is the Heart Institute at Haldasa today. Um, it's, it's, from my vantage point, a huge privilege to see what can be done together. Um, and I, uh, I hope and uh, wish for all of us that we continue to see the healing and the health that Hadassah brings for the people of Greater Jerusalem and the impact that we see far, far beyond. Choche? Yes. Um, again, I want to I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank Gideon, and um, I think that uh, one one of the things that uh, we speak a lot when during this series was about how in each one of the fields and specialties uh, things are progressing and taking us to a to the future of medicine that will be better for for all of us and we will be healthier, less worried about certain things, and knowing that. Uh, uh, we are taking care of ourselves together with a, a health system that is uh, uh, next to us. And when I say next to us, really next to us, you know, in our 
in our watches, in our devices, in the things that are sometimes even inside our own bodies. Uh, we are going to be um, celebrating this uh, this next uh, Sunday, uh, February 21st. We are going to be uh, celebrating uh, in an event that uh, we are organizing Adas International together with uh, HWCA in support of our Adasa hospitals in Jerusalem. We are going to be celebrating an event that we call it coming together to heal our world. And I think, you know, we come together with the work that you do. And I think the work together here couldn't be better represented by the, the, the last few minutes that we were discussing issues of how heart uh, medicine is connected also to genetics and how this, there is potential in connections to, to other, uh, uh, other fields of medicines because I think that the way that we look at the, at the uh, center, patient center medicine, we are looking at patients as, as a whole and we are looking at the integration into different medicines and technologies to at the end of the day, bring us a better health and our role and I speak on behalf of Adas International and HWSOA, our role is to make sure that you can take us to that future. That's all we want to do. And I say that, so I want to invite anybody and everybody who is watching now this program to join us this Sunday, February 21st for our uh, global benefit in support of Adasa hospitals coming together to heal the world. It's a wonderful opportunity. Those who still don't, don't know about this program and haven't registered, you can follow on the chat the uh, registration and do it right now because this is the last uh, opportunity that uh, we have as deadline is uh, later today. And uh, this is the way we want to make sure that uh, Professor Luria, Professor Amir and Professor Planner, as well as all other very talented and incredible and outstanding doctors and researchers we have at Adasa continue taking us into the future. Thank you so much.